today, a mass shooting in Texas and the left's attempt to immediately politicize it. We've got a lot to cover today and it all starts right now. Welcome to the news and why it matters. I am Sarah Gonzalez and uh, yesterday, as I'm sure you already know, an 18 year old gunman entered Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, shooting and killing 19 children and at least two adults. Now, this is the deadliest shooting since Sandy Hook. The shooter was killed by a lone Border Patrol agent. But before we had the chance to mourn this unspeakably evil act, and even before all the children had been accounted for, Democrats, of course, seized the opportunity to push for gun control. Never let a crisis go to waste, isn't that what they always say? Joe Biden spoke just yesterday evening calling on Americans to stand up to the gun lobby and for common sense gun laws, whatever that means. Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut denied the existence of a mental health crisis and instead cited firearm accessibility as the cause of these tragedies. Here in Texas, Beto O'Rourke, oh, we'll get into Beto O'Rourke, bashed Governor Abbott on Twitter for supporting gun rights and speaking at the NRA convention, but who's really enabling these senseless acts of violence? Is it Republicans who support the Second Amendment as a means to defend yourself from violent criminals, as well as security guards and checkpoints in schools to keep our children safe? Or is it Democrats who inexplicably oppose these safety measures and instead push for federally enforced disarmament, a policy, by the way, inherited from leaders like Adolf Hitler, all while they themselves gallivant around town with private security? Now, as we get deeper into the show, I want you to ask yourselves, if our children's safety was truly their main concern, why not support any measure we could take to make schools safer? The only reason to oppose these ideas is a sinister political motive. If the issue of school shootings was solved, how else would Democrats convince Americans they need to give up their arms and repeal the Second Amendment? Look, here are the facts. The Federal Gun-Free School Zones Act and the Texas law already prohibits the carrying of firearms on school campus. The constitutional carry law in Texas, by the way, does not override that. A criminal willing to murder 21 innocent children and teachers doesn't care about a sign and telling them not to. The only people who follow the rules are the law-abiding citizens, and because of that, they're unable to defend themselves. Guns have existed far longer than school shootings, and no one seems to be asking what possesses a young man to buy a gun and enter a school or a supermarket to murder innocent people. Is it merely the access to firearms? Healthy, happy people are not naturally inclined to kill, be it by a gun or other means. This is not a crisis of firearms. This crisis is cultural. It is a crisis of dehumanization, anger, the breakdown of the family unit, and godlessness. Our country's leaders are devaluing the concept of life at every turn, even advocating for post-birth abortions or, more clearly stated, infanticide. Why should anyone value life outside the womb when they're told that same life doesn't matter when they're most innocent? On top of that, we do nothing to support young men in America and everything to destroy them. And when something like this happens, the media and politicians clamp down even harder, dividing with their incendiary rhetoric and making the problem that much worse. Now, taking away guns won't solve this problem. Guns don't kill on their own. Ensuring the safety of our schools like Florida did after the Parkland shooting will help. But the only thing that can truly eradicate this issue is a shift in culture back towards a morally sound, God-centered Christian nation. As we have strayed from that ideal, we have seen skyrocketing levels of political violence, shootings, drug use, addiction, fatherless homes, and depression. This is not a coincidence. We are facilitating our own destruction by permitting the foundation of our country to be wiped away. So before we go more in depth on all the ways this horrible tragedy is being used to achieve political agendas, just know to fix this crisis, we have to fix the foundation of our country. Our children depend on it. Uh, At this point in time, I would like to also welcome to the program to help me unpack all of the horrible, uh, unspeakably evil acts that have taken place in the last 24 hours. Elijah Schaefer, host of Slightly Offensive, which you, of course, can find on Blaze TV. Also, make sure you are subscribed to that on YouTube. And we've got Amy Robbins, who is host of the revamped, newly revamped podcast, Not Your Average Gun Girls. Uh, I suggest that you check that out as well. Um, So, guys, I know, look, 
We actually filmed, as of the time that we had taped this program yesterday, all of this was transpiring. And I walked out of this set and uh, actually was met by Alex Stein, who happened to be in the building, and he said, oh my gosh, did you hear what happened? And I said, no, and he showed me, and I was just like, I just did an entire show on a bunch of news that, quite frankly, doesn't matter at all right now. Um, and it was very hard to, uh, to process, but as we, you know, since then, the details have, have shaken out a little bit more. And uh, of course, we know now the, the count as of the time of this taping is 19 students and at least two adults dead in this particular elementary school shooting. Uh, the suspect was believed to have shot his grandmother before entering the elementary school. Uh, she is hospitalized, is still alive in critical condition, they say, and he crashed his car near the school. Uh, he had a rifle and a backpack. They claimed that he was wearing body armor at first, but now they are saying he was not wearing body armor. So some, st some details still we have yet to find out, uh, but it ended up being a Border Patrol agent who rushed into the school and uh, killed the shooter without waiting for backup. Um, and look, I, I want to get into the way that this is being weaponized politically, but I want to give you guys first a chance to just comment on uh, the, the situation itself, Elijah. Yeah, so most importantly, before anyone politicizes it, you know, I was able to speak to some really good friends who are down there right now reporting on this, you know, and, and we're there on the scene. It's like one crisis to another. They're only down near the border because there's a crisis of human trafficking, of smuggling, you know, of, of unfettered rape. I mean, we can go on. Um, and so it's sad that it's like our country's at a position to where a bunch of reporters are already covering a bigger mm. crisis than we've ever focused on in terms of crimes against humanity that they can quickly drive an hour, you know, 45 minutes, et cetera, to another crisis, which is a crime committed against our children, right? And so it, it shows you the catastrophe and the real sadness of where we really are as, as a country that, you know, you don't even have to really fly around as a reporter anymore. You just kind of stay in one place and the crisis comes to you. Mm. And so speaking to them, you know, I think it, it, it hits home um, on what's going on when you talk to, to somebody that I know that's seen a lot of evil and a lot of bad things happen, that's their job. Tell me, you know, for the first time in my life, I spoke to uh, somebody, this is George Ventura from The Daily Caller. He's like, like I spoke to an 11 year old just now who saw his teacher get killed mm -hmm. and watched his friend get shot in front of him. And then, and you think about that and you go, what the hell is going on and the, the, the decay and the sickness in our country that you can, I can get a phone call from somebody that just goes, yeah, I just spoke to a child who watched their teacher and friend get killed. And not because of, you know, some gang violence, but, you know, while they're in school in, in what's supposed to be a safe place. I, I, I don't think it just hits home for me. I think it hits home for the country of saying, you know, other nations are not struggling with the same problem. Something is sick, something is wrong, something is very dark in this nation. And we shouldn't be having phone calls. We shouldn't be getting phone calls from reporters from anyone t saying something like that. That shouldn't be happening. And if it is happening, I would say all the things that we're blaming up front are probably not what's the issue because those are what people are trying to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. We've got to have a real discussion on why this keeps happening and why we've come to expect it. Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I mean, first and foremost, that was an amazing monologue. I feel like, get me that clip now. <laughs> every single person needs to hear everything. You just unpacked everything and, and laid it all out there from the most, the best arguments on the pro, you know, two A side and beyond. I mean, that that was just an incredible monologue. So, so thank that. you for that. But I mean, look, I'm going to come at this from a, a mother standpoint because I guarantee myself, like millions of other moms, last night in the country, the second that we heard it. I mean, not only was I in shock and was I uh, horrified. I I held my babies longer last night. I rocked them longer last night, and. It's like I, I wanted to sit there and pr process this and process it as a mom. But then on the same side, I was I just kept thinking, OK, maybe this time I knew in the back of my mind it wasn't going to happen. But maybe this time we'll have at least 24 hours to process this degree for these families before we have to do this again, mm -hmm. before we have to jump into this debate, before someone politicizes it. And unfortunately, President Biden didn't even give us 24 hours. I mean, I was watching news reporters um, giving us the facts and then having Democratic Congresswomen 
from Texas come on and immediately start blaming things like constitutional carry. And and it was like, why? I, I My sadness turned to anger very, very quickly for a number of reasons. One, because I'm like, here we go again. We're going to have to jump into this debate once again, start having this. All of us pro to a advocates are you know, going to be on the side of everyone's going to blame us that we want to see more children die. And that's just simply not the case at all, because as a mom, I want real solutions. Mm-hmm. I actually want to find solutions to this on the same on the same spectrum. Like, I don't want to see law abiding citizens rights infringed upon. And I feel very, very stuck in this. I mean, I want to go through the list of the practical things that we can be doing. I mean, I instantly started thinking why aren't these mass shootings happening inside of our professional sports stadiums? I can't remember the last time anyone was allowed to enter into a stadium with a firearm, but why are they getting into our schools? Why are we allowing this to happen? Why, you know, I I went to, why are we sending $40 billion Mm -hmm. to Ukraine when that money could be spent here securing our schools? What is going on here? And so I think it just, I quickly got very, very angry over the fact that, like, we're not doing practical things right now. We know the gun control debate is going to be out there. We know that there are going to be people on both sides of the aisle, and this is going to be a long fight. But while they're fighting this out, why aren't we taking practical steps to secure our schools like we secure our own homes, like we secure our our, our professional athletes? Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, this is just the beginning, but this is going to get really messy really fast, I have a feeling. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you, Amy. That was kind of the point that I I made as well, was just like, ask yourself why we have all of this money to throw to foreign countries. We don't, we can't, uh, we can't secure our own border. We can't secure our own schools. We have, you know, uh, these common sense, you want to talk about common sense things that we could be doing. Why don't people have to walk through the same sort of metal detector that they have to walk through at the airport at an NFL game? If you go to the Dallas Cowboys game down the street, which, by the way, my son has been to, he goes through a metal detector. If you go to a concert, you go through a metal detector. There are so many things that people have to do in their everyday lives that they go through a metal detector. And there's no like there's no negative connotation. My son doesn't ever ask me when we go to the airport. Why do we have to go through this Mm -hmm. when we go to a Dallas Cowboys game? Why do we have to go through this? Are they, do they think I'm bad? Are bad people coming through? Are they, they, he doesn't think right. of it like that. You just go through it. So it's like, why can't we be doing that? If you guys want to have this stupid conversation about trying to take the Second Amendment away and trying to prevent families the ability to protect themselves, let's have the conversation. You ain't going to get very far, but let's have the conversation. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, if you actually care about protecting these children, why in the world would you not do these other things. Elijah. Well, I am going to have to to disagree with the general sentiment of like securing our schools because unfortunately, you're not going to ever be able to secure yourself against a domestic threat and t- fully. And I mean this, sure. I mean this genuinely. Of course I mean not. I mean this genuinely. Is like why is it that the conversation has come to either A, we put a TSA checkpoint to get into a school, or B, we take away guns. Being from LA, my high school had metal detectors. Mm-hmm. I know what that was like. And that's very common in LA to have yeah. metal detectors and security, bag checks, et cetera. I mean, we'd have weeks where bags were banned, mandatory uh, locker checks. A lot of the schools in the area took out lockers entirely because of attacks. I tell people, you know, even when I got expelled from my first high school, I went to the other high school and on the first, I think it was the second day, <laughs> a kid right expelled. outside got stabbed in the back of the head. Um, and I, I mean, this is this is not an uncommon thing, especially in big cities. But, you know, you look at this and you go, OK, we're not talking about kids being violent towards each other. We're talking about a problem of people and mm-hmm. mass shootings and individuals. We have had the Second Amendment for a very long time, and we've had guns in this land for a long time. And this idea of going out and shooting up schools has not been a problem. Mm -hmm. There are many countries around the world that have plenty of firearms or access to them, and they don't have the issue. When the Europeans criticize us and say this is a purely American problem, they're damn right it is. It's a problem in our country. And, you know, and, and I bring this up, it's like, well... I don't want to hear it from people when we just spent the last several weeks protesting and borderline rioting to be able to kill children six inches up a birth canal that you tell me that you care about kids dying. You know, and I I hate to mock and I'm not mocking, you know, children dying, but there's always that that parent that's so attached to their kid. Their kid's like six and they're like, how old is your child? And they're like, you know, 
130 months old or whatever, and you're like, okay, your child's grown up. Yeah. I mean, these are grown up, right? These are babies, whatever names. They're, they're all children. They're our children of our country. And so when we're in a nation that is talking about whether we can kill our kids up until birth, Congress trying to pass a bill even, saying that we can kill these children. Meanwhile, you know, we have Potato Head Stelter saying that, you know, why are we attacking Disney for trying to groom and sexually take advantage of our children? When the conversation is about how early we can kill a kid and then also once they're born, how quickly we can mess them up, sexually confuse them, rape them, etc. You got to ask yourself the question. Not only do I not believe and, and wonder how much we really value the lives of children. Oh, you care about them once they're shot? That's what's, that's your moral mm -hmm. line? Right. But also you got to say, well, who's shooting them? Well, in a society where you tell them, you know, that the greatest thing that you can do at 18 is, you know, you come out of school, you can't read, you can't write, you don't know anything about your common history, and the greatest claim to fame you can have is to tell people you're bisexual or you're transgender. Of course people are mentally ill. Of course they're confused. They don't have any direction. No common history, no common future. We don't know what we stand for. We have no heritage, and we just keep flooding our country like it's a giant slot machine. And so you wonder, and I say this genuinely, when you destroy everything that's good, when you take away everything that's, that's powerful, when you, when you remove strong men, when you take away family values, when you, when you eradicate God, you create a void. And everybody knows that a void is a vacuum. It's like space. And when you take away goodness from a space, then it allows what to come in. By nature, it is evil. Evil finds its way in. And so if we had institutions to institutionalize people, if families were whole and you could see alarming signs, if our media wasn't so disgusting and training people in, in all of the dark... I would say the dark arts at this point, if people and friends were real and people weren't backstabbing each other and we looked out for one another, perhaps, perhaps we could live in a society where this stuff just wouldn't happen. But they want an evil society and then get shocked when people are evil. Yeah, well said, my friend. Um, I know we've all got a lot more uh, to say about it and I want to get into the uh, specifics of the politicization of it. First, I want to thank our sponsor, Home Title Lock. So uh, if you own a home or property, look, you don't want to become the victim of home title fraud. You may not know what it is, but let me just tell you, you don't want to find out personally. A cyber criminal can worm their way onto your home's title. They can take out loan after loan using your home's equity. And then, of course, they vanish, leaving you to prove that you didn't commit fraud. Uh, by the way, you could be a victim of home title fraud. You wouldn't know it for months. There's not an agency that notifies you or asks if you sold your home or added someone to the title. Uh, you'll only find out when the collection calls start for uh, the loans that you never took out. Don't let this happen to you. Do not wait until it is too late. You got to go to HomeTitleLock.com, read all the testimonials, find out how much they have helped other people. All you have to do is register your home address to see if you are already a victim. And when you protect your home, tell them I sent you for 30 days free. That is HomeTitleLock.com, HomeTitleLock.com. Uh, Beto O'Rourke, of course, gubernatorial candidate here in Texas, Robert Francis O'Rourke, uh, took to Twitter to attack Governor Abbott here. Just, oh, practically immediately, he said, Governor Abbott, if you have any decency, you will immediately withdraw from this weekend's NRA convention and urge them to hold it anywhere but Texas. These massacres aren't natural disasters, acts of God, or random. They are totally predictable, direct consequences of the choices made by Greg Abbott and the majority of those in the legislature. Abbott chose to let it happen again and again and again. Mind you, uh, again, the facts remain, the guy passed background checks, so yep. background checks won't do anything. It wasn't constitutional carry that yep. Abbott had enacted that, that like, created this problem. Uh, constitutional carry did not override the fact that he, like, this was illegal. You can't make it illegaler for him to go and commit this heinous act. But Beto wasn't done there. He also decided to crash Governor Abbott's press conference today uh, in just a despicable attempt to gain some sort of notoriety from the fringe left for being some sort of, uh, I don't know, like hero for all of these innocent children who have just died. Here's this disgusting exchange. <laughs> Excuse me. Sit down. You're out of you're out of line and an embarrassment. Hey. After sit down. Get out of line. Next shooting is right now, and you are doing nothing. No. We need to get his ass out of here. This isn't the place to talk to this show. This is totally predictable. When you sir, you're out of line. Sir, you are out of line. I'm sure you are out of line. Please leave this auditorium. I can't believe you're a sick son of a. It would come to a deal like this to make a political issue. It's only like you. Why don't you get out of here?
osteoporosis at his bones. He's so tiny. Well, I was about to say, uh, he just looks go ahead. weak. He looks weak. He looks... He is. A, that's, that's because he, he is. He looks like he doesn't even believe what he's saying. Mm-hmm. So I don't even know how he can be the champion for you know the fringe left when he doesn't even look like he has... Z- Zero authority is what he looks like. Well, the fringe left is, yeah, the fringe left is, their (laughs) fans are soy, and he clearly eats lots of soy. But I'd like to just point out as well, I notice in this video is is his one and only staffer who assaulted me for quietly being at his uh, at his press conference, and he's I notice again the police much gentler with him than they were with me when I again was standing there quietly with my cell phone, not disrupting his town hall event. And um, but but he thinks it's okay to come and disrupt Governor Abbott's t- uh, press conference. Of course, at a time like this where we have uh, children who have just perished, he thinks that maybe it's a good idea to come and create some sort of, uh, you know, national attention for himself. I, I gotta tell you, I don't think it's gonna work out very well for him here in Texas. I can't think of anything more disgusting than trying to create a publicity stunt over a bunch of children who have just died. You know, I would like to say that you're correct, but I feel like with the polarized place that we're in, in, in this society, that it was way too close for comfort with the last race between, uh, was it Cruz and, and Beto? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I hope it is, I hope, that he does not get anywhere close, but I just think of all I of the crazy know. things that he said since then, though. Well, a, a, a lot, but he's still running, and, and then I just don't know. Like, I, I mean, I would like to think that people can see through this and get disgusted when these politicians jump on these tragedies and use them for their own political gain, but. I just don't know anymore. (laughs) I'm having a lot of lack of hope for Mm -hmm. a lot of people in, in this country. And one of the things that he was talking about that is just so ridiculous to me is the fact that the left can never seem to actually pinpoint the blame on the person who is who who created this tragedy. Why don't they ever talk about the person who committed this crime? It's always the tool's fault. It's always the Republicans' fault. Well, they do talk the about it fault. if it's a white supremacist. Yeah, but sure. it's still the ra- it's racism's fault. Like racism bred it. Like right. it's, it's, right. Always, it's always it's always somebody, the boogeyman. Yeah. Yes, it's it's never it, the blame never rests on personal responsibility, mm-hmm. and that is a huge problem in this country. If we want to get back to the breakdown of the moral compass and uh, of this country. A lot of it starts with like having zero personal accountability Mm -hmm. and zero personal responsibility. And I mean, they were he was literally trying to list off and go through things that had nothing to do with this shooting. The gun lobby was not there. It was not the gun lobby's fault that the school wasn't secured. Right. It wasn't the gun lobby's fault that this kid had multiple red flags leading up to this. The gun lobby wasn't sitting there monitoring his behavior, monitoring his mental health, monitoring any of these signs, and then not doing anything about it. The gun lobby had nothing to do with any of that. And aside from that, like you said, the laws that are currently on the books did nothing to stop this anyways. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's just insane. Well, and the laws that they keep that they keep proposing that we of should course, have, of course. Are like they're not going to stop. Of course, it was instant it was instantly we've got to pass HR8. Well, HR eight for universal background checks. The kid already passed two right. background checks. Right. Well, that but that's, that's what I I, I, I do want to say this because everyone's got their own opinion. Is this a mental health issue? What is this like? This is something that is not going to be corrected. And I hate to say this, but it's it's going to accelerate and it's going to continue because in a in a communist sort of you know utilitarian world, this is the narcissism, the self seeking, the chaos that that happens. That 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 is the distinct nature. And I don't want to get in trouble for like spreading you know something that I'm not trying to say. But in the midst of all of these things, what is always blamed is right wing extremism, or it's the right wing, like you said, Republicans, racism, anything they want to associate with it. The truth is, is that these shootings are actually fully the blame of left-wing extremism. It is creating a culture of self-centeredness, of disregarding unification, of creating individuals where we do not check up on each other, we don't want to be judgmental, we don't want to you know, cause problems, you just look out for yourself, and you create lawlessness, you create godlessness. I mean, it all, it all, they're all right, they're, they're actually correct. And so they'll say, well, if we could just correct right-wing extremism, then we would. Actually, we don't have enough right-wing extremism. And then they say, oh, that's racism and stuff. No, the idea of shared common value of God of family, of having family, children, of yeah. coming together. If we had a culture built upon these things, like I said, they would have that natural accountability. You're not just looking to the government to make a new law or a new tax or a new policy. That's what the left 
extremism is. We're looking to a system to mm -hmm. fix the individual. We are looking to some sort of a policy to change the spirit and the heart of a man. But what are the ha heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can really know it? We are not going to change this through any other way than through a cultural and radical revolution within our society. And unfortunately, since we have not gotten there and the right has not learned and the left has not learned and we're still looking at this in, in a dichotomy rather than in a holistic issue, Prepare. Take your kids out of school. Don't have them around. Your home is safer. More children are going to be killed. We will have more mass shootings. We will blame every other thing except for the real problem, that we are a debased and a morally decrepit civilization. We are an empire that is falling, and these are telltale signs of self-sabotage, and there is no way and no vote and no little noodle-armed man standing up in, in, in a press conference that is going to reverse the course that we're headed on. So I want to, when we come back, um, I, I want to just to emphasize that point, I want to give some of the latest details that have come out uh, about this particular boy, because I think that you're right, Elijah, there are, like, we should be, th this should have been foreseen when you look at the way that this gentleman was on track uh, to go. But let me let me first, um, we gotta take a quick break. I wanna first thank our sponsor for this segment, Outer. So uh, look, you spend a lot of your time outdoors, uh, I'm sorry, indoors. You should be spending your time outdoors. Like 93% of your life is spent indoors, which is really depressing to hear, but uh, so many of the things we love to do, or at least we used to love to do as people, are outdoors. you got the fresh air. You've got the feeling of peace when the warmer weather gets here, like it is here in Texas. Uh, you really need to be outside. Let's make the most of it this year with Outer. This is new outdoor furniture, a new outdoor furniture company with purposely designed furniture to get you outdoors more. They make the world's most beautiful, comfortable, innovative, and high-quality outdoor furniture, all from sustainable materials. And it is the only outdoor furniture with a patented built-in cover which makes protecting it effortless. They've got teak chairs, they've got fire pit tables, they have got uh, they have got it all. And by the way, they've got the look and feel of what you'd expect at a five-star resort for less than you'd pay at a big box store uh, for something that's just going to completely fall apart with all of the different, you know, weather and, and sun and, and rain and all of that. You've got to see the difference over at liveouter.com slash news. For a limited time, get $300 off and free shipping. This is the best offer Outer gives anywhere only available to podcast listeners and only for a limited time. So you can go there. It is live, O-U-T-E-R, dot com slash news. Terms and conditions apply. Uh, there was a report in the Washington Post about this suspect that uh, really painted a picture of just a pretty violent person who appears to have previous encounters with law enforcement officials. So the shooter apparently was, and look, this report, I, I read it in its entirety. It interviewed uh, numerous, it interviewed some family members, it interviewed uh, previous friends that this gentleman had had, it interviewed uh, neighbors who lived next door. And uh, apparently he was bullied a lot for wearing black eyeliner and having a speech impediment. It was a lisp. Uh, according to his family and friends, and that he had lashed out violently against peers and strangers recently over the years. Uh, he apparently, several years ago, cut up his own face with a knife because he claimed that it was, quote, fun. And uh, this particular friend who uh, indicated that that had, had been something that had happened also said that he drove around with another friend at night on multiple occasions and shot at random people with a BB gun. Uh, he lived with his mother, who reportedly is a drug addict, a drug user, and uh, was got kicked out of her house. So there was a video that he posted to Instagram a couple months ago where the cops were there, and apparently he was calling his mother the B-word and saying that she wanted to kick him out. He spoke very aggressively to her. Um, and, you know, obviously the problems continued, the problems exacerbated. Um, but it, it just... But gotten too, the weird text messages to friends I was reading, you yes. know, and people, yes. and people were worried and he kept telling people like, oh, don't worry about it, mm -hmm. saying pictures of like magazines, mm -hmm. but like. Tagging random people on on social media. Yeah, and, putting yeah. up weird, weird yeah. sulking pictures and being very recluse and like those signs like, yeah, if you're pulling away from everything, everyone buying more and more firearms, threatening people, right. using guns, right. non-lethal weapons on, on, on uh, passerbys. Like the, I don't. I mean, what? We're still just working on arresting people from January six. Like, yeah, why, like, where is the investigation on these kind of people? Yeah. Right. Like, what else do we need for somebody to stand up and say something? I mean, clearly the signs were there that this kid is 
mentally unstable. There is something wrong. And while I absolutely agree with everything that you're saying, that we have to have the conversations that go much broader and beyond, you know, do we just take guns away or do we just, you know, put armed guards in every single school? I, as, as a mom, I obviously know that there is something much deeper going on in our society. There is a much bigger conversation that needs to be had around mental health, around the breakdown of the moral fabric, around the breakdown of the family. Like, but at the same time, I want to see practical things be put mm -hmm. into place right now that I don't. I don't say that thinking that it's going to stop every single every single shooting, but I do think that if we can give our schools and our children a fighting chance. So some of the things that as I was going through this, I'm like simple things that we could do, locking every single door in the school and having one single point of entry could potentially cut down on some of this, right? Where we can't afford to put armed guards because that's not feasible. There's roughly 900,000 schools in this country and like 700,000 cops. So we clearly can't put an armed security, like police officer at every single school. But you know what we can do? As a mom who does conceal carry every single day, in Texas, I have the opportunity to join up with other moms and we can go have private patrols. No, we can't go inside the school because we can't bring our firearms legally into the school property, but there is property outside of the school that you could go onto and you could patrol. I mean, there are practical things that we could actually be doing that I want to see happen and I wanna have those conversations. I wanna solve the other things you're talking about too, but I wanna solve these practical things too. The, so it's also interesting to me too, when you consider all of these Democrat lawmakers or all of the lawmakers who are pushing for you to disarm yourselves, all have armed security. Oh yeah, again, Davos, right? Even right now at the World Economic Forum, they have a lot of police there. I do, and I get what you're saying with practical sense, right? By, by doing things, meaning wishing the world was different, but dealing with it. The, the reason why, like you said, I think those common sense solutions of like parents getting involved is more or less what I'm trying to communicate. Like mm -hmm. it's not creating the TSA 2.0 that's going to fix this because it's not feasible. Sure. And look at the TSA, they, right. they miss 95% of the things they're meant to look at because Absolutely. they don't give a damn because they don't, they don't care because they don't, they're not personally invested. You ever seen a TSA agent? Right. They're not the nicest people in the world. And God forbid if one of you watching this is one of the nice ones that exists, <laughs> I haven't met you yet. Um, but it's like, obviously who cares? The parents do care. And that's right. my point with the education, with everything we've been seeing where parents are finally caring again and realizing mm -hmm. you can't let this leftist extremist world raise your children You've got to take back that right-wing fascism, that crazy Nazism of being just a loving parent, you know, that they try to paint, you know, like you don't want to be Hitler uh, you know, by dare caring what your kid is being taught, what they're seeing, you know, and they've demonized the parental uh, responsibility. So yeah, parents patrolling the schools. I mean, that's even helpful, not just for school shootings. That's for kids, you know, ditching school. That's helpful for kids using drugs, for sex acts, for predators. I mean, there's so many different types of things that that, that could be helpful with. And that's what's so crazy. Like you mentioned, the state goes, yeah, well, we don't want parents parents getting involved. We don't want parents mm -hmm. bringing their gun in. We don't trust. We don't want parents. We'll take care of it. Clearly, they're not taking care of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the disjoint between our culture and our society. We need to get back to individual mm -hmm. ownership and responsibility. And I will say this, though. Like, I saw the, all the pictures of all the kids who, who were killed. Oh, it's, I bawled like a baby. Like, right. like, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, like, obviously, I, I mean, I, as a man, I wasn't crying. But I, I, I look at this and... Why aren't more parents, you know, why aren't more people realizing that the responsibility is on us? Like, do you want to see this again? Like, if you're, if you're listening, you know, on a podcast, if you're watching on, on wherever you're, you're getting this, Blaze TV, YouTube, et cetera, like, is it worth sitting around and doing nothing longer and asking the same people who have created the system that has allowed this to happen continue to try to find the solutions to fix it? Or are you just going to get up like the people have in the school board meetings, running for city council, taking things over and taking back the country that has been stolen from you, that has been robbed from your hands. And you're the one that you always pay the tax. You pay the price with your money. You're always paying the price with your mental health and your well-being because of the culture. And now you're paying with the blood of your children. Like, is do we need more kids to get killed for you to finally realize like enough is enough? Take control of yourself, your community, your family. I'm just wondering, because it's like, it's not me, it's not you. It's not just mm -hmm. us in this room. It's like, it's every Everybody involved here. Do you just want to continue to watch Netflix at home and go to your you know, job that you don't even like to make the salary that doesn't even afford the life that you need because of inflation? To what? Expect that Beto and Abbott are gonna are gonna duke this out and solve the issue. A guy in a wheelchair and a guy who probably couldn't even throw a punch. I mean, I'm just saying, right? I mean, that's what the fight has come to. Real men and real women, get the hell out of your seat. 
go to the offices, to the places, and find the solutions for your community that can prevent this. It's only you who can make the change. Yeah, uh, very well said, my friend. Uh, you know what, let's go ahead and take a break. We'll be back. I don't think I should set a guy on the chair, but. <laughs> Exclusive footage has been obtained from uh, January 6th inmate Brandon Fellows. There's, apparently, he is staying in a really, really awful conditions. There, We have a clip here of uh, Fellows showing mold, he says, exploded out of his sink. Watch. This is some, I don't know if you can make this out, but this is some of the fluid that shot out from that yeah. sink. This is not drugs, okay? These headphones, uh, this is a headphone case. Um, and look at this, bro. This is, I, I shoved it in there with it because it exploded all over my toothbrush. It was right next to the sink, like, right? the sink over there. Uh, there are several more videos. Fellow shows his toilet that was clogged and left unfixed for days. Fecal matter, uh, the jail left on the ground. Laxatives he had to take because of his poor diet. He said he had gone six days without a working toilet, nine days without a shower, and 14 days without recreational time. Uh, apparently, he has Asperger's and ADHD and is a slow learner, according to him. He went into the Capitol on January 6th and smoked marijuana in Senator Jeff Murley's office. He's been representing himself in court and allegedly violated multiple conditions of his release, leading to him being jailed. I just feel like, where is AOC when you need her to come and talk about the horrible conditions? Oh, that's right. It's only when it's pe illegal immigrants coming in from the border that they care about the conditions. Well, yeah. I mean, wasn't there a time when, I mean, if Gitmo, like actual Gitmo, when they had all the... ACLU lawyers out there fighting for better conditions and I mean like saying right. that we, we can't actually for, for we can't do this for, for terrorists, terrorists. Yeah. yes yes actual but, terrorists yes. yeah <laughs> but I think this I mean there's a whole lot going on in that video that I have a lot of questions about mm -hmm. I've never been to prison I can't imagine that any <laughs> prison condition is lovely but that was disgusting <laughs> first off I don't know what that was coming out of his sink but I mean, like, what, what, what? Is the left trying to send a strong message that this is your fate? This is your fate, you crazy, Trump-supporting, right-wing extreme. Like, this is what we can do to you, and this is what we will do to you. I mean, it, it's like, is that the message that they're trying to send here? It's just crazy. Yeah, of course. Elijah. I just uh, spent some time with, with an individual um, that was uh, detained um, and put in jail for quite some time uh, for just you know, illegally picketing, which is the term for um, standing in the wrong location. That's yeah. what that means. Okay. Um, it's, it's a made up charge. Uh, things are trumped up and basically like with uh, you know, certain individuals that are involved, what they do is they put a, a whole resolute of extreme charges, felonies. And then they add these bogus um, misdemeanors, like illegally picketing or like standing in a restricted area, these kinds of things. And what they force you to do is to take a plea deal, and this is what they're doing with people, to where in order to drop the felonies, which which is crazy, because they say, well, we're going to convict you anyways. Basically, the judge is, is in the in the jury. You're not going to have any chance of getting away in the district court. We need you to plead and uh, you know no contest and end up taking these lesser charges. So they're forcing people through political manipulation to take jail time, essentially, and house mm -hmm. arrest, but lesser because they over prison, right? So they're 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 manipulating them. Then I talked to somebody who just got out of jail. I know I just talked interviewed somebody who's now going to jail who agreed to the lesser terms and there's somebody out there too named baked alaska who literally went to trial and, and said to the judge like they they're they're threatening me and saying if i don't accept this like they're going to put more additional charges and the judge literally went said to him you know uh, from what i saw like so you're saying that like you you're being told to accept these charges but you don't really believe that you are guilty, so then we can't, like, I can't legally let you accept the charges if you don't legally believe that you're guilty. Meaning, like, they're, they're and they're like, and then the FBI is denying that they're manipulating people. FBI is, you know, got a good track record right. of honesty. That being said, is, is, is then when they put them into the, um, 
into the into the jails, and when they make them and they set them up on these on these these contentions, they're the conditions that they're put. They're you know they're denied access to see their family. I don't know if people know this. Not to see their family. They're not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not allowed you know the right visitation. They don't get the proper hygiene. They're treated like they're like Gitmo detainees. Like solitary confinement. And, I think yeah. it's better in Gitmo though. Yeah, yeah, no, but legit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying though. And and they're treated like they're not human, like in like inhumane. And it's so crazy that our politicians care so much about these terrorists in Gitmo, but yet the people who stood in a restricted area and had to agree to guilt out of manipulation so that they didn't go for long prison times are then held in conditions and treated like they're animals. And, and I just want to remind people, that's what your government's doing. There is, I think, several hundred that have been arrested. And what, is there like 70 or more that are still in prison or jail now? It might be more uh, and more that are going to jail. This is still going on and it hasn't gone away. Well, I mean, again, because I keep going back to like, he went into the Capitol and smoked marijuana in a senator's office. Like, really? This is, we're treating him like a violent criminal, like a terrorist, because he went and smoked some pot in some sense. Like, Give should him a fine. He, right. Like, right. Like, should he have done it? No. But again, this is the party who keeps, they want criminal justice reform. Right. They, want to, they want to decriminalize offenses like that. But, this, but the moment that it happens in their castle... Now, all of a sudden, jail for life. But also, whatever happened to all those uh, Antifa members that were starting riots and burning down our cities and being violent criminals? What happened to them? Where are their their where their their charges? Oftentimes, their charges were dismissed. Yeah, the guy who tried to stab Chappelle yeah. with a gun knife. I still think it's funny that he ended up being bisexual because I, I like I just love the idea that he try you know he, he uh, like taped a knife to a gun he couldn't even choose his weapon like he couldn't choose his sex partners like he's just he's an indecisive kind of guy um, but he's not the most indecisive I mean the DA is obviously dropping the felony charges so it's like you can get more prison time and jail time for smoking pot in an office than you can for publicly trying an attempted assassination attempted murder yeah. so you literally yeah for smoking pot because your politics are wrong and because he was bisexual they're gonna let him off because you know he was offended by jokes. So if you're offended by jokes, that's okay. And we that's like a lawless society. How can one, one function yeah. where prison sentences are given unequally based on political bias? It's insane. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and take a quick break. We'll be right back. The bisexual gun knife guy is my favorite person. <laughs> I, gun knife guy. I like I love I live for that. All right, I haven't seen this yet, but uh, my producer pulled a new video from Libs of TikTok that I feel like probably goes along with the entire theme of our show. Uh, let's watch and find out. Okay, so in the center of it all is obviously me. Here's me, in case you forgot. I run this account. I have bright orange hair. I am married to Jake. There's Jake, super cute. We currently live together. I am also dating super Spencer. Cute. Here's Spencer. We've been together for a while, but are not currently living together. I am also dating Ellie. She's my newest relationship, but just as important as all the others. Now, Ellie is platonic life partners with Izzy. Here's Izzy. And that just means they plan on spending the rest of their lives together what? without any romance Whoa. or sex involved. Now, Izzy is also casually seeing Spencer. Here's Spencer Whoa. again, just in case you forgot. Remember, Spencer is dating me. And I am married to Jake. Now, Jake is currently dating Rocket. This is Rocket. They are very hot and very tall. Rocket also has another long-term relationship with his girlfriend. Also has a queer platonic relationship with another partner. Shut up. Shut <laughs> up. Shut up. I did not swear. Therefore, I don't have to take the swear jar that is sitting right there. I, did, I almost did it, but I didn't. We've got about a minute left. I want to hear from both of you. Elijah. Ew, I don't... Just, <laughs> no, next. That's it. <laughs> So none, of, none of these, uh, they're Next. all degenerates. They're all complete it's too confusing to me. Degenerates. Try just being married. It's all it's it's, hard enough. I, I just Don't felt like that. you guys ever watch like um, true crime murder shows and I felt like we're trying to solve a, a murder here as to who did it, who did it. Here's the central person. This is the this is the victim. I'm like, what is the she drama, talking about? Imagine the drama. The drama. God, oh. why? I why? Know. I feel like that's like high, it's like a junior, that's like junior high, but add in like probably some like minor pill addictions and then like weird <laughs> kinky sex. 
we've got ourselves a disaster. But only with some of them, because some are in platonic relationships. Yeah, I was like, that's yeah, called you know? being gay. What was that? Right. He's like, the guys, dude, that, that's a gay person. That woman's just a lesbian. And y'all are just, you guys just have no self-control. It, this is, that was honestly, that's there the worst flow chart I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. I never want to see it again. Uh, Elijah Schaefer, host of Slightly Offensive. Make sure that you are subscribed. Also, Amy Robbins, host of Not Your Average Gun Girls. Subscribe. Uh, and uh, thank you guys for joining me today. Thanks. Thank you.